shall we? Yep, let's do it. Uh, all right, so um, it's a pleasure to introduce Vedika Kamani as our VAMO speaker today. Um, Vedika is a condensed matter quantum information theorist who has done uh, a number of groundbreaking things in non-equilibrium dynamics and dynamical phases of matter. Uh, Vedika did her PhD at Princeton under Shivaji Sondi and then went on to Harvard as a postdoc in the Harvard Society of Fellows. Uh, recently, she joined the faculty of Stanford and uh, has already received awards such as the um, Stanford Terman Fellowship and a Sloan Research Fellowship. Um, so with that, uh, Vedika, take it away. Okay. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Adam, for the uh, introduction and for inviting me. Uh, I'm, I'm really uh, glad to be here with all of you virtually, uh, even though I can't see you. Uh, I'll, I, I know you're in the ether somewhere. Um, so, uh, you know, today I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll try to keep this fairly broad because I heard this is uh, quite a broad audience and, you know, I'll, I'll try to stop many times for, for questions. I really hope we can make it interactive despite it, uh, despite the virtual format. Okay. So, um, you know, in recent years, something that's becoming uh, increasingly clear to many of us is that there's this amazing confluence of all these different areas of physics coming together, you know, ranging from condensed matter to AMO to, to quantum gravity. Uh, just late last year, I was uh, part of this conference organized at Google titled Quantum Gravity in the Lab. And, you know, the same, the, the audience had string theorists, quantum information theorists, AMO experimentalists. And I think just about 10 years ago, if, if someone had thought, told you that a string theorist and an experimentalist would be in, an you know, in, in, in the same audience at a conference, uh, we, we, that would have been strange to most people, right? So indeed, uh, one unifying thread that has been driving this, this, this amazing uh, confluence is the application of quantum information theoretic uh, insights into various questions in many body physics. So for example, studying the dynamics of quantum entanglement or quantum information scrambling, whether it's in systems of electrons and solids or cold atomic gases or black holes, um, and all of these different cases, studying these quantum information theoretic insights, uh, quantum information theoretic measures has led to various new insights which are uh, essential for understanding questions ranging from the black hole information paradox to more foundational questions of quantum thermalization and many body localization. And in, indeed also to more practical attempts to build quantum simulators and quantum devices in the laboratory setting, right? And in all of these different cases, you know, one, one theme that has been at the center of all of it all, uh, of it all has been the study of the dynamics of isolated or closed many body systems. Okay. And, and um, in most of my talk, I'll actually step away from this isolated uh, limit, but, but it, it, it's informed where a lot of the development has come from. Okay. So, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a condensed matter uh, theorist by training. So many of the questions that I find most interesting are driven by the condensed matter perspective of trying to search for new kinds of emergent phenomena in many body systems, right? So here the traditional approach has been to, uh, to study various time independent Hamiltonians, whether it's the Ising model, the Heisenberg model, the Hubbard model, of course, all of these are, are interesting in that they're, they're representative of some new kind of representative of uh, new kinds of phenomena, new uh, of experiments, right? So the usual approach is you have time independent Hamiltonians. Um, you let, look at the spectra of these models and usually you look for interesting uh, phase structure and universality near zero temperature, okay? So you're, you're very interested in low temperature physics in, in the usual case. So the reason for this is that when you have a gap, uh, when you have a gap quantum system, you have a ground state. This ground state typically has only area law entanglement. It has all sorts of interesting quantum correlations. And then you can map out a phase structure in, in parameter space by, 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 by basically uh, realizing that all, all uh, points in parameter space that you can connect to in, in modern language that you can uh, go between using a finite depth local unitary transformation such that uh, your, your, your gap doesn't close belong to the same phase, right? So we can, we can characterize phases of matter as those that are related to various fixed points um, and, and the phases that you can go between without closing a gap. And as you go, as you transition from one phase to another, you have to go through some intermediate gapless region, and this is a phase transition, okay? 
And you, or what we know from, from our uh, classes in STATMIC is that these phase transitions usually fall into broad universality classes, okay? So you can have uh, critical exponents, scaling functions, and all of these don't depend on microscopic details. Okay, so, so this has been a large part of the program for, for, for the last several decades. But, um, but what we're going to now do, what, what, I'll, what I'll discuss in this talk is in recent years, we've become interested in trying to get universal physics at high temperatures, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna step away from this paradigm of looking for gap ground states and, and classifying universalities of phases and phase transitions at low temperatures, and even look for universality at high or infinite temperature, okay? So for those of you who do dynamics, um, this, is, uh, this is perhaps not strange, but, but from the traditional point of view, it's very weird to talk about universality at infinite temperature, okay? Because traditionally highly excited states, those that are at in the middle of some many body spectrum, you know, very, very far from the ground states, these are usually very, very highly excited. They have volume law entanglement. They have all sorts of thermal fluctuations, okay? And they really look classical in many ways, okay? So usually you would say all the interesting quantum physics is happening near, near low temperature. You may have some quantum critical fan, but by the time you get to high temperatures, you're just doing, there's all sorts of messy classical physics that you're doing, okay? So it's just, it's just classical non-universal, okay? So, um, so, so the, the really new and exciting thing is that in, in, along multiple different axes, uh, over the last uh, decade or so, we've been talking about universality at high temperatures, at infinite temperatures, okay? And one context in which this comes out, perhaps the, more, the best known context, is um, in studying the dynamics of isolated many body systems, okay? And here, uh, a question that's been uh, central to uh, a, lot of, a lot of developments in recent years is, is the question of whether an isolated many body system undergoing reversible unitary time evolution can act as its own bath and bring subsystems to thermal equilibrium. So usually when you're doing textbook statistical mechanics, you have in mind a system that's coupled to some reservoir or bath. The bath acts as a source of energy particles and the system is eventually establishes thermal equilibrium at late times as a result of interactions with that reservoir, okay? But when we're but, but but now we're talking about isolated systems, so there's no external reservoir, but you can never nevertheless ask whether the system can somehow act as its own bath and cause this kind of uh, internal decoherence that can bring subsystems to thermal equilibrium. Okay, and this is this is really a statement of different parts of the system getting entangled with each other in a way to establish local thermal equilibrium. And when this happens, we say the system is thermalizing, and when it doesn't happen, the system is many body localized. Okay. And uh, the, this transition, you can, you can tune various parameters in your problem. For example, you can tune disorder strength, you can tune interaction strength. You can tune various parameters in, in your problem to drive a transition between a phase of matter that is thermalizing and a phase of matter that's main body localized. Okay, so this, this is really an extended region in parameter space where the dynamics of your system fail to establish thermal equilibrium. That's what we mean by MBL. Okay, and that's why it is a, a new dynamical universality class. It's a new possibility of what can happen in the dynamics of isolated many body systems, okay? And this transition between thermalizing and many body localized system is a new kind of dynamical phase transition. It's a quantum phase transition that happens uh, at very high temperatures. None of what I was saying right now about whether and how systems establish thermal equilibrium have to do with low temperature physics. You can be talk about, talk about very, very highly excited states. And there's this new kind of quantum dynamical phase transition between thermalizing and many body localized systems and the properties of this transition are still very much under study, but one of the ways in which we understand this transition is through, the in, is through uh, a singular change in the entanglement properties of highly excited states, okay? So as you go from thermalization, thermalizing systems to many body localized systems, what happens is that your, your highly excited many body eigenstates go from being volume law entangled and classical to actually being area law entangled. So highly excited states start resembling gap, ground states of gap quantum Hamiltonians. okay? So this is a brand new kind of phase transition, one that happens at infinite temperature and one in which quantum entanglement, you know, this, this observable that, you know, really wasn't part of the canon of, of standard many body physics until recently, the one in which entanglement plays a key role, okay? So, uh, so good. So, so you know. So this is this is a, a, a yes no answer to what can happen in the dynamics of isolated systems, and this already gives us kind of two universality classes, if you will. But we can broaden beyond this, right? And we can ask: Are there any 
is, is there a sense in which there are intermediate phases of matter that are between this coarse, broad brush, yes, systems are formalizing and no systems are not formalizing, okay? And when I'm talking about dynamical universality classes, I really have in mind some kind of asymptotic limits about uh, infinite sizes and infinite times, which are the limits in which phase transitions and phases are well-defined. Um, but, you know, there's also all sorts of interesting uh, intermediate regimes. Okay, so there's the asymptotic limit of uh, intermediate universality classes, but for systems that do thermalize, you can ask whether they reach local thermal equilibrium and fast or into some accessible time scales, or if they, they somehow establish thermal equilibrium only on very, very long times, okay? And if it takes very long times, then in the interim, you may still be able to see intermediate pre-thermal dynamic regimes. Okay, and those are those are interesting too. And okay, so good. So so you know, so this is this is trying to broaden the question of you know what all can happen in the dynamics of many body systems. But you know, we can also ask, just like there are various different kinds of thermalizing phases, are there many different kinds of MBL phases? Okay, so it's not just that the dynamics take you towards a many body localized phase, but that the dynamics take you takes you towards a specific kind of many body localized phase, which can then transition to a different kind of many body localized phase, which in turn can then transition to a thermalizing phase. Okay, so we now have this whole zoo of new kinds of emergent phenomena we can get in the dynamics of, of our many body systems, and this whole new class of phase transitions between them. Okay. So, um, you know, th th this, this has really opened up the door to, to many, different, uh, many different fundamental questions. And uh, so, so let me, let me uh, just discuss a few of them. And one of the things that's been really exciting is that um, these fundamental questions have really gone hand in hand with various experiments in, um, in atomic physics or even in, in, in solid state platforms such as, uh, such as nitrogen vacancy centers or, or NMR spins. And in all of these uh, attempts, you know, the, all these recent attempts uh, in, in, uh, in, in recent times have been to build many body isolated quantum simulators. Okay, so, so in the laboratory setting and trying to build quantum simulators, uh, a key goal is to create these kinds of isolated systems. Uh, and generally, it's pretty hard to actually cool things down to low temperature. So, so the setting where systems are at high temperatures is, 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 is the more uh, is the default option, right? So, so we can switch between asking these very fundamental questions and actually um, start to probe them in the lab all, all hand in hand, okay? So uh, just some of the questions that I'll, that, that, let, let me just highlight some of these questions. You know, one is, that, you know, in a system that does reach thermal equilibrium in an isolated uh, setting, how does the system establish thermal equilibrium? So uh, as I mentioned, the traditional viewpoint here was in the form of uh, reservoirs and bots, but with, the, with uh, an isolated system, this, this uh, dissipation has to happen in some internal level, right? And the system has to act as its own internal reservoir so that even while the system is globally pure, it can locally become mixed. And there was this beautiful experiment actually uh, led by, by, by Adam uh, in Marcus Greiner's group where, where they really probed the dynamics of quantum entanglement uh, as a route to understanding how isolated systems establish thermal equilibrium. Okay, uh, we can ask what is the nature of this new kind of phase transition between many body localized and thermalizing systems? Uh, and really, as I mentioned, you know, this is a phase transition in the entanglement properties of uh, your, your system, right? And there's been various experiments on uh, on MBL uh, in, in in various different platforms, including in in a, a recent experiment in again, in Marcus Greiner's group was, in, was involved in seeing entanglement dynamics in MBL systems. Um, this experiment was one of the early ones, the, the one I flagged here. And, and this was really remarkable because what, what the experiment uh, did, this was an Emmanuel Bloch's group. They prepared this, um, this uh, trap, they, they trapped these uh, atoms. And uh, you know, the initial state was all the atoms were on the left half of the trap. And as you waited in time, out to the coherence time of the experiment, there remained this discernible imbalance between the left and the right half in the density of the system, okay? So usually your expectation is if you start some system with all the atoms in the left half of the room, it's very quickly gonna spread and take over the entire room. But here this, this imbalance persists out to the times that they can see, okay? And then the other question that I mentioned was, you know, are there intermediate robust non-ergodic dynamic of universality classes between many body localized and thermalizing, okay? Are there other me methods for breaking ergodicity? 
So, uh, you know, th th this question has received a lot of attention in, in over the last uh, year or two, you know, it broadly, you may have heard of many body scars. So this is something that uh, came out of an experiment in Misha Lukin's group, where uh, this was an experiment on, on a Rydberg simulator, and they prepared a certain initial state, which is actually a very high temperature initial state with respect to some affected Hamiltonian. And what they found is that for very, very long times, this initial state continued to show these kinds of coherent oscillations and didn't just settle down into an equilibrium state, okay? Uh, and if they probed other states at the same temperature, those did rapidly settle down, okay? So this is, this is the scars generally refers to the existence of um, atypical athermal states within an otherwise thermalizing many body spectrum, okay? So the existence of these anomalous states was, was uh, it is rare, okay, most states do thermalize, okay, so this is somehow intermediate between localized and thermalizing. Um, so now, uh, you know, so this, this is really exciting that this can happen, but as best as we know, all models of scars that have been uh, studied to date uh, are all uh, very, uh, they're all fine-tuned in some sense, okay, so if you come in and you generically perturb your system, you destroy signatures of these scars. So indeed, you know, while we want possibilities intermediate between MBL and thermalization, we're also hoping to find robust possibilities between MBL and thermalization to call it a, a new phase of matter, right? We want it to be so that you can come in and you can perturb your system. And within the class of perturbations, uh, you, 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 uh, the, the phase persists, right? And then of course, um, the, the uh, one big broad question is, you know, now that we've uh, abandoned thermal equilibrium, what are new kinds of phases of matter that we can get, right? All, all our traditional frameworks for thinking about phases and phases of matter are based on the strictures of thermal, thermodynamics. And once we step away from that, uh, a, a whole new world of uh, options opens up. Um, and for example, you know, one of the best known examples of this is the discovery of time crystals in periodically driven many body localized systems. Okay, so time crystals do not exist or cannot exist in uh, equilibrium, but uh, have found new life in this out of equilibrium setting. Okay, so this is just like a, uh, to give you a landscape of, of the kinds of different questions that we've been asking. Um, so, uh, so now I want to uh, step away a little bit from uh, questions probed by information theoretic measures to how we get uh, you know, some answers to these questions using information theoretic approaches or tools, okay? So um, you know, in this setting, so, so most of these questions that I'm asking here, they're very, very hard questions, okay? And trying to uh, answer them, they've been around, you know, in some sense, they're very fundamental. They've been around since the inception of quantum mechanics, but trying to answer them in some concrete uh, settings is, is uh, is really challenging. We're talking about highly excited, strongly interacting many body systems. You know, you all the usual tools of, of many body theory have been developed for, uh, for low temperatures or weakly interacting systems and all of those uh, crutches we don't have anymore. Okay, so we really need to develop a whole new tool set to attack these questions. And some approaches that, are, that have proved very useful is in uh, thinking about maybe more minimally structured models. Okay, so this is, this is again, uh, coming back to information theoretic tools, okay, so usually we, we started with Hamiltonians with conserved energies, okay, so you have that some time independent Hamiltonian, you could look at its ground state, you could classify correlations, phases, and so on, okay. Um, you, can, you can now relax um, some structure in this, okay, and then go from Hamiltonians with conserved energies to so-called Floquet models. These are periodically, the, the, these are time dependent Hamiltonians where the dependence in time is periodic, okay. So this has less structure because you've abandoned energy conservation than time independent Hamiltonians, but it nevertheless has a notion of quasi energy and has a notion of eigenstates. So these, 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 um, these are only one step uh, less structured than, than time independent Hamiltonians, okay? And indeed in Floquet models, this is where, uh, where, people, where we discover time crystals, okay? But then what you can do is abandon as much structure as you possibly can and consider so-called Brownian Hamiltonians so these are models of random unitary circuits, okay? So here the, the idea is to, is to ask, you know, some of these questions of thermalization and, and entanglement dynamics, these can be answered. Uh, you know, you, you can ask what insights can I gain at these, into these questions, keeping only the ingredients of locality and unitarity and none of the other details of your problem, okay? And the hope is that the insights that you gain in this way, that you hope that the, the problem becomes more tractable 
uh, in looking at these, uh, looking at models of this kind, and that the insights that you gain in this way port over to more realistic Hamiltonians that you may care about. Okay, and indeed, this program has already been very, very successful. Um, so, uh, in, in the many body setting, a lot of this was started by work by Adam Nahum in 2017, where he was studying the dynamics of quantum entanglement in um, in, in these classes of random unitary circuits. Okay, so um, he he had this really he had these really nice pictures. So you you again locality and unitarity are the only are the only constraints. And in doing this, he was able to map this problem of how quantum entanglement grows in um, in these many body systems two problems of classical surface work to, to classical stack mech models that are solvable okay and and uh, this really provided a lot of insight into uh, the the growth of entanglement that that seems to port over you know via numerical simulations you can check that it it does seem to port over into uh, just regular time independent hamiltonians and and more than numerical simulations the idea is that the this allows you to come up with a picture for how the entanglement is behaving in the system or how the entanglement is going in the system. And once you have the picture, you can step back and see, is there anything in that picture that required me to use anything more than locality and unitarity? And if not, then you expect that that should work even in more realistic models, okay? Um, we've done a lot of work in thinking about uh, operator spreading, notions of chaos, scrambling, out of time ordered commutators, again, in these models of random circuits. Um, We've asked, like, uh, you know, so one of the things these random circuits do is to take away all structure except locality and unitarity. But something you can ask is that, you know, what if you now try making your your um, circuits? What if you try adding in little pieces of that structure back in? Okay. So something we did is to consider random unitary circuits, which were uh, minimally structured but actually had a conservation law. Okay. So so you can have circuits that, that conserve some kind of global U1, some global total spin symmetry, but are otherwise as random as they can, okay? And when you do this, you can ask, given that you have this local conservation law, you expect the late time dynamics to show some kind of dissipative hydrodynamics corresponding to the existence of this conservation law. And you can ask, how does that dissipative hydrodynamics emerge from under unitary dynamics, under closed unitary dynamics, which is obviously reversible and non-dissipative, right? And again, using these toy models of random circuits, you can give a very, very concrete answer to this, to this question. And again, the insights port over to more realistic settings. Okay. Um, so, so you know, the, the, these three examples were um, examples that, that I'm most uh, familiar with, but of course, random circuits have been used uh, very, very much more broadly than this. For example, uh, they were used as models of black holes, you know, way back even in 2007 in the early work of Hayden and Preskill and, and in many developments since. And, you know, perhaps of most interest to this audience, you know, the, the programmable simulator that Google just, uh, just created to declare quantum supremacy, uh, that, that was a model of a random unitary circuit, right? So what, what Google was doing was that they, they had this, um, system of qubits and they're they're acting with random gates drawn from some gate set okay and looking at how the evolution behaves under that gate set and they were trying to benchmark what uh, how, whether or not they had this closed isolated unitary system okay so so the the idea of moving from time independent hamiltonians to unitary circuits is is one that has application over a wide range of subfields and a wide range of questions okay and today I want to, I want to um, address two different questions uh, using this, this kind of paradigm. Uh, and maybe I won't get to the second one. So, I'll, so, so let me tell you what, I, what I'll be doing. So, um, so in the first part of the talk, uh, I'll be discussing entanglement phase transitions in uh, non-unitary. So I'm going to now still have models of random circuits, but I'm going to make them non-unitary. And in fact, I'm going to make them completely non-unitary. So they're going to be models of measurement only models. Um, and we'll see that in this class of models, you can actually get a kind of entanglement phase transition. Okay, so, so one of the things that I, that I mentioned to you is that, you know, we really, uh, th this MBL to thermalizing phase transition is this completely new paradigm in, in the theory of phase transition. So we really want as many examples as we can about in, of systems that may be tractable in some way that display such entanglement phase transitions okay and and this model of, of non-unitary uh, noisy circuit dynamics will be one such model and I'll, and I'll discuss this uh this this was work done in collaboration with Matteo Equality, uh, Mike Gullens, Sarango Balakrishnan and David Hughes 
Uh, we just posted the paper in the archive a couple of weeks ago. And you know, this was really led by Matteo Epoliti, who's a, who's a uh, postdoc here at Stanford, and he's, he's really amazing. Okay, and then time permitting, um, I'll, I'll uh, talk uh, a little bit about uh, th this new paradigm for localization that, uh, it, that, that came out of work done in collaboration with Rahul Nankishore at Boulder and Mike Kermale also at Boulder. And this is the idea of localization from Hilbert space shattering. Okay, so since it's very likely I won't get time to go with, uh, to, to discuss this, let me just give you the, the punchline. Okay, so the punchline is that this is a robust, provable way to break ergodicity with only two conservation laws. Okay, so usually when you're talking about many body systems, many body dynamics, um, you know, the, the, the standard assumption is that if you have one or a few conservation laws, for example, energy or, or total particle number, then that is not enough to impede thermalization. Okay, you need an extensive number of conservation laws. For example, for you know, integrable systems have extensively many local conservation laws, and those don't thermalize um, uh, to, to your usual Gibbs ensemble. They, they have, uh, they, that's right. Okay, so, so usually you would not expect that just having two local commuting conservation laws can break ergodicity in any, in any uh, useful way, okay? But instead, what we showed is that if you have two conservation laws, which is the conservation of charge and dipole moment, that is provably enough to, to break er ergodicity. And it gives you localization by this new mechanism, which is very, very different from how you got localization when, when you were talking about MBL or Anderson localization. It gives you localization from this new mechanism, which we call the shattering of Hilbert space, okay? And the idea here is that if you have these two conservation laws, and you have a lot of your, your Hamiltonian as a result of these conservation laws could look block diagonal because you have lots of these different symmetry sectors. And usually you would expect that, you know, any states that you can get to that have the same quantum numbers for these additional symmetries, which in our case was charge and dipole moment, should be allowable under the dynamics, okay? But what we showed is that you can prove that if your dynamics are local, right, and, and physical Hamiltonians are local, if your dynamics are local and you have these two conservation laws of charge and dipole moment, then states that have the same quantum numbers under the symmetry are still not connected via the dynamics. Okay, so these individual uh, symmetry blocks get 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 subdivided into exponentially many sub blocks. Okay, and states that live in sectors, these emergent sectors, uh, which have very few states, you can have some sec some states which can't connect to any other states under local dynamics as long as charge and dipole moment are conserved. Because these are perfectly frozen states, they're perfectly localized. And then there are other states which can connect to a few others and others that can connect to yet many others, okay? So, so this is a robust way. And, and what we showed is that, you know, as long as these, con these constraints of, of uh, uh, charge and dipole moment conservation and locality are maintained, all models in these classes will continue to break ergodicity in this way. Okay, so this is a robust way to attain this intermediate dynamical universality class between thermalizing and localized. And while we um, while we uh, formulated this, uh, while the cleanest realizations are in these models of circuits with different conservation laws, uh, there's actually very physical uh, consequences. And indeed, you can have um, you know the simplest physical realization for such a for such a phenomena could be just having a, a system with you know system with say uh, bosons or fermions Fermi Hubbard model, and if you st stick it in a tilted potential. Okay, so I think Wasim Bakker talked about this. Um, a few weeks ago, so if you have a system of fermions stuck in a tilted potential, you get an emergent conservation of dipole dipole moment for very long time scales, and you can use that to actually get this kind of uh, shattering behavior in your dynamics for very long times. Okay, so this is not just abstract; it's also physically observable. And actually, we are talking to to Wasim's uh, group to try to see some of this. Okay, so so good. So uh, so now I'm gonna. Uh, to, I'm going to switch to the first part of this talk for the remainder. Are there any are there any questions so far? Perfect timing, Vedika. I was just going to say that we had gotten a couple of questions on the introduction. Um, okay. So so one question is that given finite experimental time scales, how do you distinguish between a pre thermal phase and an MBL phase? Yeah. So that's a that's a great question and. Um, it's generally extremely hard to do. Um, so, uh, right. So, so, so what, what we what we rely on for those uh, 
to, to do that is, you know, so, so indeed, so there's a difference between asymptotic uh, localization and just localization for a very long period of time. And for example, one of the uh, pictures that I showed you was localization in two dimensions, but there are all of these different, um, there are all these different uh, uh, papers talking about how MBL in two dimensions may actually be unstable to various non-perturbative uh, rare phenomena like the inclusion of thermal bubbles, okay? Um, and as a matter of practice, if your experiment has a finite lifetime, you really can't do very much. Um, but as a matter of principle, you know, so this is where, um, this is where these theories and toy models come in in a way, because as a matter of principle, what you can do is, um, is so there's, there's a proof for many body localization in one dimension, which proves that if your system is one is, is in one dimension and it's exponentially, uh, it, it has exponentially decaying interactions under various conditions, it proves that MBL exists in one dimension. Okay, so, so I guess the, the idea is that if I was only looking at the experiments, they can of course inspire new theories like, like SCARS, but just looking at the experiments with finite lifetimes would not be enough to, to, to conclusively say that you have one phase of matter or another, and you do need to back that up with other theoretical calculations that you do have control over. And this is one case in which, you know, these random circuits may prove helpful because it can give you tractable limits in which to demonstrate in principle that a many body localized phase exists, okay? Uh, another uh, set of experiments that I'm very familiar with are, are those done in time crystals. So here there've been various experiments in, in a system of trapped ions, in a system of nitrogen vacancy centers, in a system of a clean NMR solid, uh, and actually, um, despite very similar signature between these different experiments, um, if you step back and you analyze these experiments, again, not, not in the real experimental setting, but more theoretically, you find that all the experiments so far on time crystals are all, pre, are all in this pre-thermal regime. So none of them, including uh, e even the ones that are trying to approximate many body localization as best as they can, uh, none of them are actually seeing a true many body localized time crystal. And for those experiments, actually, we came up with various diagnostics that you can use. So you can, you can use different probes of the phase and you can use different initial states. So there are various diagnostics you can use uh, that can distinguish between the pre-thermal phenomena and the long-term phenomena. So, so it's a combination of like, sometimes within the experimental time scales, you can tell, you just have to use different, uh, different probes. And other, in other cases, you really don't have the experimental probes to tell the difference. And then you have to rely on theory to say that this phase does or doesn't exist in an asymptotic sense. So, sorry, that was too rambling, but hopefully. It no, I think that was a very useful answer. It actually leads into another one of the questions that we had, which is that sort of a lot of the examples that we look at for non-thermalizing behaviors, like scars and integrability, these mm -hmm. are known to be very fragile examples. Yeah. yeah. You know, and then there's some, you were mentioning there's some results that maybe MBL in 2D is also sort of unstable. So do you mm -hmm. have a feeling for whether sort of all of these non-thermalizing objects are in some sense fragile? I don't know if it's yeah. a well question. But. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a great question. And in some sense, yes. Um, so really the many body localization phase transition is often viewed be best as an instability towards thermalization. And, you know, that's just, you know, you have this strongly interacting, highly excited system, okay? So the, the system really does want to thermalize. It's, it's very fragile in the sense you couple it to a bot, you, you do any of these things and, you know, that's going to drive your system towards this messy thermal equilibrium state, okay? So, so something has to conspire to prevent this from happening. And the things that have to conspire are quite delicate, okay? So, so in one dimension, for short range systems, many body localization does exist as a phase of matter, right? So, so you, can, you can start with some, some Hamiltonian and you can, you can perturb it in, in any which way you want, as long as the perturbations are weak, your, your phase persists. Okay, so that is an extended phase of matter. But even in one dimension, if you couple your system to a bot, asymptotically, you expect that that bot will destroy localization, okay? So with SCARS, it's even worse because even within the class of closed short range, uh, interacting many body Hamiltonians in one dimension, you can come in and perturb it weakly and everything gets destroyed. Uh, we believe that to be true even for integrable systems. And then this example that I, that I was mentioning for, from this Hilbert space shattering, here, you know, there's a limited class of perturbations. It's in a way, it's like a symmetry protected dynamical phase because if you, if you perturb using charge and dipole 
conserving uh, perturbations, then the phase persists, otherwise it gets destroyed. But that's, but that's generally true of systems to try to tend towards decoherence and, and thermalization. Thank you, that was a very helpful answer. I think maybe we will keep going and we'll collect a few more questions for later on. Sounds good, okay. All right, so uh, so let me let me uh, start with the first part of this, uh, of this talk, or actually I think it'll be the only part of this talk, but that's fine. Um, so, uh, so here I want to tell you about this class of entanglement phase transitions in these, in these non-unitary circuit models, okay? And there's two views that I could have taken in presenting this, right? One, one was to focus on the the entanglement phase transition part, right? And indeed for uh, people coming from, uh, for, from the perspective of many body localization, that is a very, uh, it, you know, that, that may be something that's of most interest if you have this class of entanglement phase transitions, right? On the other hand, I could, I could present this more generally uh, while thinking, you know, as a model for entanglement dynamics in non-unitary or noisy circuits, okay? And I think for, for this audience, this latter perspective would probably be of more interest. So that's, that's, the, that, that's the view I'm gonna take, okay? So, okay, so, so to, to get started, um, you know, something that, that, that really doesn't need much, uh, uh, that, that doesn't need to be said, uh, said at all is that, you know, Quantum entanglement is really the, the best known information theoretic measure that's at the, the that's behind all of the efforts that that, that, that are underway, and it's in, in all attempts to achieve quantum advantage or quantum supremacy in applications ranging from quantum computing to cryptography to metrology. All of these applications require you to have highly entangled many body states. Okay, if you if your states didn't have quantum entanglement, you would not get any quantum advantage. Okay, so. There is really this resource theoretic viewpoint where entanglement between your your between the different constituents of your many body system is what's going to give you the uh, give you the edge in over classical uh, over classical uh, devices, right? Um, but we also know, of course, that entanglement is a very, very fragile resource, okay, in, in any real world setting. So if you're an experimentalist, the thing you have to worry about all the time is is decoherence from the environment, right? In any realistic setting, you have your system and you're trying to make it as isolated as you can, but you know that there's always going to be this environment lurking in the background and it's gonna keep trying to come in and mess with your system and it's gonna give you in practice noisy dynamics, okay? So even if you have this massive Schrodinger cat state, you just need the, the tiniest uh, flimsiest interaction with some mouse scurrying around outside and you collapse the cat, right? So, so this is again another example of how decoherence tends to win, right? So, you know, the, the, these figures are taken again from the, the Google experiment. And again, you know, the, the whole point of that experiment was that, you know, here is this ideal evolution with this random unitary circuit. But in practice, we actually have noisy evolution because there's all sorts of errors that are going to occur in your system all the time. And the question is, how do you uh, how do you, you know, this noisy evolution is going to make your system look more and more decoherent, more and more classical. And the whole point of that was that, you know, can we tell apart this quantum evolution with, with this finite density of noise? Can we tell that apart from just plain old boring classical evolution? Okay. And they were able to, to run this experiment with enough accuracy that they were able to resolve to the very small percentage because, you know, it, it's, basically not noisy, the probability that you never make any errors is, is minuscule, but to that minuscule accuracy, they were able to resolve that, that they still had some quantum advantage left, that all the quantum information didn't leak out into the noise to make it purely classical, okay? So, um, so you know, so the, the, the picture, if you will, is that, you know, you have these short range entangled, low complexity states. To gain any kind of quantum uh, advantage, you want to go towards highly entangled, highly complex states, okay? And indeed, if you had a perfectly closed quantum system and you were just doing unitary dynamics, the, the, the evolution of entanglement in time would take you towards this high complexity state. But if you have uh, open quantum systems and you have this, um, if you have open quantum system dynamics, then indeed uh, what, what happens is that, you know, your system is gonna constantly come in, interact with some environment, and that's gonna destroy this kind of, uh, this complexity or this entanglement that you're trying to build up. And there's this tendency of the system to keep um, being measured back towards low complexity, if you will. Okay, so this is, this is the, the picture that, 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 that's kind of intuitive, right? And um, to, to try to uh, address this in a, in a uh, concrete model, 
uh, just, just in the last year or two, the, this, this set of authors uh, considered the following question. Okay, so this is just a, this is a, this is a model of open system dynamics, which is tractable. And the question was, what if you have a random circuit where you have your random unitary gates as before, but now these gates are interrupted by projective measurements that are occurring at some finite rate, okay? So at every instance in time, you have some uh, probability of going in and measuring your system along some basis, okay? So this could be the computational basis, it doesn't matter, okay? And the, the question was, what happens to a quantum state under such dynamics, which is the model of these open, of, of open systems, okay? And the picture is that this is somehow a competition, again, between coherence and decoherence, okay? The unitary evolution is trying to evolve you in this coherent way, but the measurements are coming, you, are, are coming in and decohering your state, okay? So, so while, it, in fact, the universality class of this transition, I'll, I'll show you that there is a transition, and the universality class of this transition is very different from that of many body localization, but it's still, um, got these ingredients which are similar in spirit, which is this, you know, competition between coherence and decoherence between the tendency of systems to get strongly entangled versus uh, get disentangled, okay? So, okay, so, so you know, so, so they were, uh, again, studying these quantum states, and what they found is that there is actually this phase transition, this, this concrete phase transition at some critical strength of the measurement rate, right? Uh, between an entangling phase and a disentangling phase, okay? So, so what's being addressed here? So when you're studying open system dynamics, there's various approaches we can take. We can, we can work with the density matrix of the system as a whole and do, uh, you know, evolve them with quantum channels or do Lindblad dynamics, or you can look at individual quantum trajectories without doing any averaging, okay? So if you start with some initial state and you look at individual stochastic quantum trajectories, so each one of these paths represents a particular realization where you started with some pure state, you went in, you made some projective measurements. Uh, by the way, the measurements don't have to be projective. They can be weak as well. It's just easiest to think of with projective measurements. You go in and you make some projective measurements that changes your state in some way, uh, and then you keep going, right? So over time, your system loses norm, right? But you can always renormalize your state. But, but the point is we're going to consider a particular trajectory. And then you can ask, you get these different late time states, you're not gonna average over measurement outcomes in any way to create a density matrix, but for these different late time pure states, what is the entanglement properties of that, of that late time state, okay? And what, what you can, what, 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 what was found is that um, if your measurement rate is small enough, uh, at late times, the, the spinal state that, that you end up at is actually volume law entangled. But if your measurement rate is very, very uh, strong, then you end up with a disentangled area law phase, okay? So as a function of this measurement rate, if you're at P equals zero, so there are no measurements being made, then you know that um, in many ways, this is just pure unitary dynamics. So you know that you are gonna get this volume law phase. Okay, so that limit is simple. If you're at P equals one, that means with probability one, after every layer of unitary gates, you're gonna go in and make these local projective measurements. So you collapse your entire state onto a product state and there's no, there's no further, um, there's no further, uh, uh, that, that, that's going to be an area law state, okay? But the, the surprise was that actually this volume law entanglement persists to some finite range in P, okay? So this conventional wisdom that decoherence always wins uh, is not quite true. And actually for weak enough measurements, you can get this large entanglement to persist and get this phase transition at PC, okay? And heuristically, there was a very nice picture for this that was put forth in these papers as to what may be going on. And the picture is that the unitary dynamics is, is, is scrambling, okay? And it's hiding this quantum information into very, very non-local degrees of freedom. Um, in, in a way, it's forming a quantum error correcting code. And so if you go in and you make local measurements on your system, those local measurements actually don't gain that much information about your system because it's, it's spread in these very non-local correlations, okay? So, so the idea is that these local, um, that, the, that, the, that, the, that this scrambling under the unitary dynamics protects your system against some finite density of local measurements because the local measurements are not able to um, are not able to gain as much information as you might think. Okay, so uh, in, in these papers, the, the view that was put forward is that this measurement based transition is really a transition in the error correcting properties of your circuit or a transition in the quantum channel capacity. Okay, good. So 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 this is the picture, right? That you have this this uh, this uh, 
uh, entanglement that's changing in time. And there is a piece that is coming from, from positive scrambling that's the growth in entanglement. And then there's a piece that's coming from the degradation of entanglement due to, due to environmental decoherence. And an appealing picture is to get a transition by equating these different rates, right? That you have some rate at which things are getting scrambled, a rate at which things are getting uh, decohered, and you get you get some kind of transition by balancing these two countervailing forces. Okay, so this naturally leads to the question as to you know how scrambling should the dynamics be, right? And how, how scrambling can I can I do do I need the dynamics to be to still get this kind of protection of quantum information to still build this good quantum code? Okay. And, uh, you know, so, so since I've spent a lot of my life doing many body localization, the, the first uh, setting in which I wanted to think about this question was actually in, uh, in, in a system of many body uh, localized, uh, it, you know, so, so I've written here, there are many body localized circuits, but actually you can just have a many body localized Hamiltonian that's subject to projective measurements at some, at some rate, okay, but, but let, let's do circuits. So here, uh, as a circuit realization, there's this picture of many body localization where the system is described uh, in, in terms of this uh, extensive set of local integrals of motion, which are known as L-bits. Okay, and these L bits are coupled via these exponentially decaying interactions, but there's, there's an effective model that can be written entirely in terms, which is diagonal in terms of these local tau z degrees of freedom. Okay, so to, to simplify this, um, a circuit realization of a localized uh, model is one where you act with some kind of, where you act with uh, gates between spins zi and zj uh, at some distance, and then you have um, these uh, local um, uh, lo local uh, fields, okay? And the, the main point is that because these spins that are distant are only coupled, you know, first notice that the, this model commutes with all the different tau z's, okay? So, so there's all these different integrals of motion. Those don't, those don't evolve in time at all. But nevertheless, because you have this exponentially weak interaction between distant spins, those lead to exponentially slow dephasing, and that dephasing can give you a, a growth in entanglement that's logarithmically slow in time. Okay, so this is so usually your entanglement growth and your your uh, your scrambling is ballistic in time. MBL is a model of uh, of a system where the growth of entanglement and scrambling is logarithmically slow in time. And uh, the question is, in in such a system, what happens if you go in and you add projective measurements? Okay. Um, and in fact, to, 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 to make this question even more dramatic, something that we did is we cut off our gates, okay? So we had these gates that were connecting these arbitrarily distant spins. So you had these long ranged gates, okay? And we say that, okay, let's cut those gates off at some finite spatial distance n, okay? So our entire circuit is just acting with the CZ gates, okay, these are, and, and, and now we can even make it Clifford, that's just for, for computational simulation, it's not that important. But the point is you're acting with these diagonal in Z gates, these ZI, ZJ gates, these are the black lines, okay, out to some finite distance. You're acting with these on-site diagonal in Z gates, which are these phase gates, okay? And then you can come in and you can make some, make some measurements either in the X or the Z basis, okay? So in the, so, you know, this, in this model, the unitary part of the dynamics is completely non-scrambling. They're finite range gates. They can cause the entanglement to grow at most by some order one area law uh, amount, okay? And, uh, and, and there's absolutely no long range growth of entanglement, no long range, uh, no, no long range scrambling. Okay. And now you're coming in and you're adding these, you're further adding measurements in this problem. Okay. And to our surprise, what we found is that even for this model, there actually is a volume law phase. Okay. So as a function of these different measurement rates, as a function of the range of our gates, uh, we find that there's this extended region and parameter space where there is a volume law phase. And in fact, this volume law phase has a ballistic growth of entanglement. Okay. So, so without measurements, you had a, a logarithmic growth of entanglement, but with measurements, you end up getting this ballistic growth of entanglement. Okay. So, so the picture is that in this model, the volume law exists because of the measurements rather than despite them, okay? So even though the unitary part alone or the measurement part alone gives you an area law, the combination of the two gives you this extensive volume law phase, okay? And, you know, one thing that you might say is that, okay, maybe this is just a consequence of like you come, came in and you made measurements in the X basis, so you broke the L bits, uh, and those were the conservation laws that were giving you slow dynamics, and maybe maybe that's all you need, but that's not true because you actually do need some minimum range of gates. You need enough complexity in the model in a way that I'll, that I'll make more precise. So you don't, it, it's not just a consequence, you know, if you, if you just had nearest neighbor gates or, or, or next nearest neighbor gates and you broke these conservation laws, that's not enough to give you this volume law phase, okay? So, 
So good. So, so the big surprise is that this phase existed. And then what we realized is that for this particular class of models, you can actually uh, you can actually use this, the, the, you, you can start with this Elbit model and, and use it to, to motivate a, a much broader class of, of models, which are these measurement only models, okay? So what happens is that instead of working with this circuit where I had uh, measurements and unitary gates interspersed between each other, you can, you can play a trick and you can actually slide the measurements uh, past the unitary gates, okay? So, so that changes the thing, the object that you're measuring. And at the end, you just have, um, you know, these, these more non-local uh, operators that you're measuring, they're multi-site measurements. But in this, in this particular problem for this particular class of dynamics, they're all uh, operators, again, with a finite range, okay? You don't get these very long operators just because the, the dynamics in your model, in your circuit are very, very special. They're just these, they, 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 they're completely diagonal, okay? So they can't, they can't produce these very long, complicated operators, but they give you these short, unentangled Pauli strings of operators. And then you can take all your gates and you can smush them right at the end but at the end, you just have this one layer of gates, okay? And this one layer of gates, as I mentioned, can only change your entanglement by, or, by an order one amount. So it doesn't change whether or not you have an area law entangled or volume law entangled phase. So you might as well get rid of them altogether, okay? So this trick is, is again, very special to this class of non-entangling dynamics. You can't do this in general for the, for the previous models that I was discussing, okay? So, so now you have this kind of measurement only model where you're just going in and measuring these multi-point operators. And you know, you just like a game of quantum Tetris, okay? So the, the, the rules of the game now abstracted away is we have some set of Pauli strings, okay? Uh, we have a probability distribution on these strings. And at every time step, you sample from this distribution, you, you, you pick an operator, and then you decide to measure it, okay? And you keep doing this to your initial state, and you repeat until your dynamics reaches some kind of steady state, and you ask about the entanglement properties of the steady state or other, other properties of that steady state, okay? So this is a huge parameter space of models, okay? Uh, all, all sets of Pauli strings are fair game. So to make the parameter space kind of tractable, you can put in additional assumptions, for example, locality, or you can limit the range of, of your uh, interac interactions. You can do all of these things. You can make the probabilities translationally invariant, but this is just, you know, there's, there's a big family of models, okay? And, you know, so we looked at various different models in our paper, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, tell you all the models we, we looked at, uh, because, but, you know, you should just know that it's this, um, unlike the, the case of the previous uh, models, which had unitary circuits with uh, measurements, and there was one parameter, which was the measurement rate, this has a huge parameter space. Okay, and one of the things that we've been struggling with is how best to put all of these different operators and models in some kind of one phase diagram, okay? So, because even if you fix the range R, you have four to the R minus one possible species of Pauli strings and this parameter space is still four to the R dimensional, but grows very quickly. Um, and so one of the kind of more limited set of models that we consider the factorizable models where you have some string, but the probability of give, obtaining a given string is just obtained by the, by, by the probabilities of obtaining any single, uh, of, of single um, of, of operators on, the, on single sites. Okay, so it's just, it's just uh, it, it just factorizes. And in this model, there's only three parameters. And again, you find that there is some volume law phase and various area law phases. Um, we can go in and we can, uh, study various critical properties of this phase transition. Again, I won't go into all of these details, but this phase transition, uh, like the ones that were studied previously for unitary projective circuits, uh, looks like it is a, a conformal field theory. Okay, uh, and this is again very, very surprising. Okay, when 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 this was found for these models of unitary projective dynamics, you know, no one was expecting the criticality to be conformal to start. You know, there's no space-time symmetry here. You're doing this very messy stuff. So the fact that you get a, a volume law entangled phase, an area law entangled phase, and a critical point that happens to be a CFT uh, was, was quite special. And here we find that there's these measurement only models, uh, we, we, we still get uh, a similar kind of criticality, even though the exponents may be different, but it still looks, looks conformal, okay? Um, good, so, so this, this um, leads to the, the uh, main question of, you know, what's driving this transition, okay? The unitary projective case, the scrambling and unscrambling behavior were separated into two different processes and independently tunable. But in this measurement only case, the separation is impossible, okay? Because the measurement can both scramble and unscramble at the same time. And so how do we sort this vast landscape of models 
from more to less entangling. Okay, so so one one quick picture that's useful to have in mind is you know the circuits that we're now looking at are these circuits where we are only making these multi-site measurements. Okay, and you can take these multi-site measurements and convert it back into a circuit of unitary unitary gates uh, interspersed with with local measurements, on-site measurements. But these unitary gates now are highly correlated, right? Because if you have some unitary gate, you have a local measurement to get this measurement only model, you need the, the unitary gate that comes next to just be the conjugate of the one you applied first, okay? So this is not the most generic uh, model that you can write for, uh, for unitary dynamics of projected measurements. And indeed, you can immediately see here that if you deleted these measurements and you and your dagger cancel, you just get the identity, right? So that's why it, it, it's, just, it's the measurements that are both scrambling and unscrambling, and you can't separate this in any way, okay? And, you know, so, so the, the, the picture that, we, that, that we're starting to develop is that the thing that's driving this transition is some notion of, of complexity or incompatibility or frustration in your measurement ensemble, okay? And you can really understand this by considering two simple limits, okay? So uh, to start, think of the least complex set of measurements you can do, right? So if all your measurements are only one side, and they all commute, okay? Then at in your steady state, you know, if you, you can start with some state, um, you make a measurement of sigma z on some one side, you put in the up basis, on the next side, you put in the down basis, and you can keep going like this, right? And you just, you can simultaneously satisfy all the measurement operators and put your steady state in a simultaneous eigenstate of all of these operators, and you get an area one, okay? Um, on the other hand, sort of the most complex ensemble that you can think of is, you know, you can draw any poly string that's allowed with equal probability. Okay, so the first time around, you do some poly string. You put your you, you put your uh, state in an eigenstate of that string because you measured it. Okay, then the next time when you make a measurement, that in, in the second time step, the the string that you draw has an equal probability of either commuting or not commuting with the first thing that you measure. Okay, so if it commutes, you can make that measurement again and you can get one more bit of information about the system. But if it doesn't commute, then you cannot simultaneously know the expectation value of both those strings, you don't gain any new information, okay? So, so in that sense, the, the information gets hidden. So the strings that are most, um, that, are, that are most kind of maximally frustrated or maximally anti-commuting, the set of strings, th th that's what kind of drives this transition into this volume block phase, okay? And it's still, we're still, trying to understand how best to characterize this, this frustration or incompatibility. And you know, just a, a couple of things that we've tried in this is to, is to actually map it to these nice graph theoretic problems. Okay, so what you can do is you can take your, your ensemble of operators and represent them as vertices on a graph. And then the edges between these operators are drawn um, if and only if the operators on the different vertices anti-commute, okay? So, so the, the structure of this graph, actually you can show that it fully determines the dynamics of your system. It reveals symmetries between different classes of operators that may look inequivalent, but have the same graphs, right? And this quantifies for you just how frustrated or, 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 uh, or um, incompatible your, your measurement set is, okay? Um, so, you know, so, so what we were really hoping for is to take this, this frustration graph and come up with some one graph theoretic measure in this frustration graph that can serve as a single tuning parameter. Uh, for example, you can uh, look at uh, what the, uh, the, the, the average number of, of uh, edges you have in the graph or something, and that's some measure of anti-commutativity, but the, but the story isn't actually that simple. Um, and, you know, it, 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 uh, you, can, you can have, uh, I won't go in, okay, I don't have time to go into these details, but the idea is that you actually need some notion of frustration in your frustration graph. Okay, so you can have graphs that have many, many edges. Okay, uh, but if if there are there are these graphs known as bipartite graphs, and there the idea is that suppose you have two classes of operators. Okay, so suppose you have A operators and B operators, and all the A operators commute between themselves, and all the B operators commute between themselves. Um, then the, the then there's an A code which is an area law uh, phase, and you know a B code which is an area law phase again. And what, what happens is that if you mix the two together, then depending on, the, um, depending on whether or not the A's and B's exist with exactly equal probability, you can get either a critical point or area law phases. So in this particular class of models, which are mapped to bipartite codes, there is no, uh, there is no volume law phases. 
edges, okay? Even though you can have many different edges. So, so the point is, it's not, it's not a simple story. We have a heuristic picture for, for wanting frustration in these graphs, but it's not, it's not immediately apparent what, what we should be doing, okay? Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop here. Uh, I just wanna say that what we, we've looked at various other things, for example, when you're doing measurement dynamics, these non-unitary uh, uh, circuits is always an issue of like, you know, is there gonna be spooky action at a distance? Is there any notion of locality? Uh, and indeed, you know, even in a finite amount of time, you can transfer, uh, you can make a bell pair between the ends of the system, but, but you know, that's a very rare event and uh, it's not really known how to, how to uh, write down diagnostics of operator spreading or, or, uh, or uh, codes like OTOX and so on for these uh, measurement models. And we, we came up with one diagnostic that does show a nice light cone. So, so statistically, there is still a notion of locality in the system. Um, we looked at various uh, properties of this, of this emergent quantum code that's, that's a volume law phase, right? So the states that are resistant to, it's like, it's, it's, it's a kind of a meta code. It's, it's, you're making all these measurements and you're, you're creating a code that's resistant to uh, the same kinds of measurements that you, were, that you were making. Okay, so we've looked at different properties of that. And uh, with that, I just want to, I want to conclude and, and say that, you know, we, we study these measurement only dynamics, which is a new, new playground for entanglement phase transitions in non-equilibrium quantum physics. Uh, there may be experimental setup where, setups where making these uh, low point entanglement, uh, low point measurements are easier than, than full unitary gates. And there are many open questions to explore such as the criticality and universality classes of these models. Um, something we're thinking very actively about is the error correcting code properties. Uh, you can do this for different kinds of systems. There's topological codes in higher dimensions and, and how it, it's interesting to ask how those measurements would interplay with those. Um, and you can, you know, the holy grail, if you will, is uh, predicting which phase you're in based on the graph data and really trying to understand, you know, what, what features of this frustration graph are, are, are most relevant. Okay, so with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you, Vedika. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, we've, we've built up quite a set of interesting questions for you. We probably won't get to all of them. Um, but so the, the first one is from Sunwan Choi. Um, and he's wondering, so you said that you nearest neighbor and next nearest neighbor is not enough. You need some mm -hmm. longer ranged gates than that. Is that something that you can really prove exactly or is that sort of numerical intuition? Uh, that's a numerical observation. So we find that the range, the, there's, a, there's a critical point as a function of gate size and that happens to be a three plus epsilon. So we need some smattering of, of range four gates to, to, to get this. It's not enough to just do range three gates. Okay. Um, so there's another question. And, from... and, and the intuition maybe is that, you know, you, you need your measurements to be frustrated enough or incompatible enough. And if they're too short range, then, then that isn't the case. Okay. Excellent. Um, so there's another question from Ehud Altman. It says that in the phase diagram, you showed that there's a critical interaction distance for n equals three. I guess this may be very similar. Um, and that volume law appears only for n greater than three. Is this general or is it special for Clifford circuits? Um, so, sorry. Uh, no, so the exact location where the critical point happens is, is not universal. So, so in these measurement only models, you know, so we can, we can actually map these, uh, we, can, we can take these L-bit measurements, map it to this kind of measurement only dynamics. Here we get a, a critical point at three plus epsilon. But if you had those factorizable measurement ensembles, there you can show that if N is two, you get only, you get either an area law phase or a volume law phase, but nothing, um, but, but, but not either an area law phase or a critical phase for N equals two, but for N equals three, you can get a volume law phase. So the exact, uh, location of n, I think, is non-universal, um, and I, I, I've done this also for just a time-independent Hamiltonian numerically with with uh, measurements at some Poisson rate and Elbit Hamiltonian, and even there, I found that I needed the n to be slightly greater than three. So, so that didn't change between Clifford or time-independent, but but mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not sure how deep that is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so uh, changing topics a little bit, we have a question from Dave Weiss. Um, and so he's wondering, so there are some recent, uh, ah, where did that question go? Um, so that there are some recent results suggesting that some of the, the numerics and the experimental evidence for MBL is, was not as 
robust as was originally thought. And so do you have a comment on how sure one DMBL is in you know, exact theory? Um, I, I think 1D MBL is, is, uh, is very sure in exact theory. The, the paper that was calling those numerics to, to, uh, to question uh, had various problems and we've actually written a, a pretty long archive article on it. Um, and yeah, so that, that paper was not bringing up any qualitatively new mechanisms. Like, you know, so, so part of the instabilities that we realized for higher dimensional MBL was, you know, here's this here's this rare bubble of thermal phase that can exist. This is the way in which it may delocalize you. So, you know, that is a qualitative insight. Uh, the paper that, 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 that was trying to call MBL into question was just doing very small finite size numerics and the kind of numerics that they did, you can actually apply that to, to models of Anderson localization on graphs where there is provably a localized phase and you get very similar results. So it was very strongly finite size affected. There was no new qualitative insight into that. And we've actually uh, written a very long paper discussing the various problems with their finite size scaling. So, so I think at this point, um, at least nothing has happened to give me pause on, on, on how certain I am about how, uh, about whether MDL exists in 1D with, with exponentially decaying interactions or not. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have another question from Hillary Hurst, which is how much does the probability distribution of the measurement operators affect the steady state phase? Uh, yeah, so so um, so there's you know the probability distribution of the measurement operators uh, affects whether or not you get a volume law in the steady state phase. Uh, the things that we're trying to understand now are are more detailed properties of the steady state phase. Like you know, even though it's volume law entangled, it doesn't look like a random, how random volume will entangle state. And there's various correlations in there, you know, which is connected to these quantum error correcting code properties. So we're, we're trying to understand what the full set of variables we should look at to characterize those late time states is. And then we hopefully want to relate that back to, uh, to this kind of, you know, uh, to some measures of how to characterize the ensemble. But, but, but those are all questions that we're currently exploring. I don't have a, I don't have a definite answer to that. Um, hmm. Let's see, we had a couple more questions, I think, regarding the, the connections to error correcting codes. Mm -hmm. um, I think in particular, you know, there's this sort of counterintuitive statement that more scrambling is more error protection. Right. Um, but so is there any way to sort of take this and then try to design something that is is decodable or is the scrambling in some sense, meaning that it's extremely hard to retrieve the information even though it's not lost. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So, you know, so this 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 connects with the, so that there's various statements that, that ETH or eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, random circuits, very strongly thermalizing systems form the best codes. And while that's true as a matter of principle because you can't gain information about your system using local measurements, actually taking that code and trying to do something useful with it is also is also very hard because it's it, it, your, your your information is stored but it's stored in these very highly non-local uh, degrees of freedom so indeed the decoding operation becomes correspondingly hard so so they are good codes i'd say they're not very good practical codes mm -hmm. yeah all right maybe i'll hijack and ask one of my own personal questions um, so Steve Flamia and his postdoc showed that if you had a poly model and the frustration graph was a line graph, then you could solve it by free fermion. And yeah, that in yeah. fact, that's the only ones that you can free fermionize. Right. So does that mean that these are, does that put these models very specifically in one of your classes or make them very much non-scrambling or? If you have a yeah, like that, that's a great question. We, we've been looking at that paper in, in, in quite a bit of detail. So, so we, we actually used some ideas from that paper to do this kind of mapping that I mentioned that, you know, different models that, that can look like they have different sets of operators. If they have the same graphs, they're, they're the same. So one of the things we were trying to do, so indeed the models that are mappable to free fermions, those are, th those are uh, critical or area law typically, uh, unless you break some free fermion structure in the way you're doing your measurements uh, in the first place. Uh, but, uh, you know, in these factorizable ensembles that I mentioned, when n is two in those factorizable ensembles, there's various edges that are explicitly free fermions, and those, those graphs can be mapped to the ones that Steve Flamia was talking about. But the interior is not, not free fermion in any obvious sense, and we still get either area law or critical uh, behavior. 
and we, we were trying to take those graphs and map it to uh, Flamia's graphs and, and we weren't able to do that. So, so, so that's still a, but, but indeed the, the spirit of what he was doing is, is very related to the spirit of, of these, th this kind of graph-based um, classification. Um, well, we, we have a few more questions, but we've also been peppering you with them. So uh, I, I don't know if you... I, I'm, I'm happy to, to stay as long as... <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then, uh, so Dan Stamperkern had a question, which is, uh, should I be surprised that measurement drives a transition from area law to volume law entanglement in your local gate model? Isn't that exactly what happens in MBL where decoherence and coupling to environment take you from non-thermalizing area law to thermalizing volume law? Right, so, so, no, so, so, in, so the, the, in MBL, the idea is that, so the, the area law and the volume law phases uh, exist for uh, completely closed systems. So no, no measurements, no environmental decoherence. It's all a ma matter of internal decoherence, if you will. And for an MBL system, as soon as you couple it to a bath, even with an epsilon strength, uh, the, the, ex the, what, what we strongly believe is that that immediately destroys MBL. So there's no, there's no sense in which you can uh, take the MBL system and get MBL to persist for a finite density of measurements. So and that's because decoherence wins. So that's why the expectation before these, the set of papers looking at unitary projective models was that you know when there's no measurement whatsoever, that's your p equals zero point, you get a volume law. And then at p equals one, if you're measuring everything, you get an area law. And the expectation was that you know even if you have an epsilon p, that, that, that may be enough to decohere your system and drive you towards an area law phase. So the surprise was that you can get this extended volume law, uh, which is, which is which, which is retaining that amount of quantum information, even in the presence of that decoherence. And with MBL, any small amount of decoherence destroys MBL. So it's all, it's all for closed quantum systems, whereas this was for open, open systems. Great, thank you very much, Vedika. I think we will uh, stop peppering with you, you with questions. And now I wanna hand it over to Adam for a couple of announcements. Uh, all right, so thanks again, Vedika. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone to uh, nominate speakers. Uh, if you haven't, we'll be sort of scheduling the next round of speakers uh, for upcoming talks. Um, and I wanted to uh, highlight that next week we'll have Monica Eidelsberger uh, speaking. And also there is a quantum sciences seminar in our sister series, uh, which will be given by Kang Quen Ni. Uh, and that's on Thursday at 17 CEST. Uh, okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Vedika, I have a Thanks question. Thanks again, Vedika. Yeah. Um, is there a picture where, uh, when the measurement rate is comparable to uh, the local Hilbert space size times the interaction scale, that you get the transition? Mm -hmm. Like basically, when like you've made enough measurements that you can completely project out the state on a many body. Uh, in the many body Hilbert space based on the local measurements that you've done? Because like if I have a volume law entanglement, then basically any, any possible, uh, uh, any state locally uh, is possible, right? right? Um, so by making one measurement, I don't fully specify the state on the other, in the, in the remaining Hilbert space of my system. But if I make that's enough right. measurements locally, then I will specify it. That's right. So, so this P is, is, is telling you the density of the rate of measurements, right? So, so at every, you know, so you've got some unitary bit, let's even forget that, right? So let's imagine that you created some highly entangled state. Let's <coughs> worry about where it came from. And then you want to go in and you want to measure a finite fraction of your entire system, right? And indeed, if that fraction becomes large enough, you do collapse onto uh, uh, an area law state. Um, but, right, but, but, uh, I, I, because that, so there is this uh, appeal to the quantum decoupling theorem that was, that was there in, in Ehud and Sunwan's paper that was really nice. So, so what they showed is that, you know, if you have just a very, what, what's known from the decoupling theorem is if, if you have just this completely high random, highly entangled state, and you take two subsystems of it, say one of it is a subsystem whose entropy you're interested in, and one is a subsystem that you're planning to measure, then what's known is that the, the 
joint density matrix of, of the measured system and the subsystem you're interested in is very close up to exponential accuracy to, um, to, to, to a direct product of those two subsystems. Right. Okay? So then if you go in and you make measurements on, 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 on the subsystem M, you don't actually change the entanglement properties of the subsystem S in any substantive way. And to get that, you need to, to appeal to this decoupling theorem, you need the, that the combined size of M and S should be larger than half the system. So maybe that's kind of what you're, what, what you're getting at, but, um, but that's just a heuristic view for how scrambling can, uh, can protect this information. It's not, uh, it, it doesn't give you a quantitative prediction of, you know, this is where the transition point will happen. So, so from that point of view, it's not like, you know, you're, you're literally equating something and saying, this is what sets BC, but, but it is indeed true that you need to, if you measure absolutely everything, which is your P equals one, then you don't get this, then you don't yeah. get this case. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, well, Vedika, thanks so much. Um, and uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I think yeah, we'll thanks again. <laughs> Yeah, that's great. Okay. Bye.